lava cakes. We'll need butter, bittersweet chocolate, eggs, sugar, and flour. For our equipment, we'll need some custard cups, a couple of mixing bowls, a 9 by 13 pan, a 12 cup regular size muffin tin, we'll need a half cup dry measuring cup, a straight edge spatula, measuring spoons, a rubber scraper, a wooden spoon, a whisk, and I have the cookie scoop to help move the batter into the pans. Before we begin mixing our ingredients together for our molten lava cakes, we'll need to prepare the pan. And so to do that, we're going to butter uh, or grease eight cups because this makes eight servings. So we're gonna make eight molten lava cakes and we're gonna put a little bit of butter in the two outside lines of the muffin pan. We're gonna leave the middle row completely empty and we wanna get enough butter in each cup that it completely covers it on the bottom, up the sides, and especially in that crease. So we're just gonna add a little bit of butter to each uh, muffin cup, and then we're going to spread that butter around to make sure that it completely coats the entire surface without having big globs of butter left behind. Once we've managed to get the butter covering the entire surface of the muffin tin uh, in the cups that we want to put the lava cake in, then we're gonna put a little bit of flour into each of those eight cups and we're gonna move it around in the pan so that the flour coats the entire bottom sides and creases of each muffin cup in the pan. So we we'll probably want to start out with about a quarter teaspoon of flour in each greased cup. So we're doing this to help make sure that our molten lava cakes will flip right out of the pan with not uh, no problems, not sticking in any way, um, and that they'll release easily from the pan after they're finished baking. It keeps them in good shape to serve. Now I will say it's important that when you are doing this step that you make sure you move the flour around with the pan over a counter or over a sink. You do not want to do this over a garbage can because if you accidentally drop your pan then you've dropped it in the garbage and you don't want to do it over the floor because the flour uh, could spill and any spilled flour would become a trip and fall hazard. So for safety purposes, you want to keep it over a counter or an empty dry sink. And then when we're all finished, we're going to tap off the excess uh, upside down into the sink so that we just have a nice coating of flour on the butter. There's another step that we have to prepare ahead before mixing the rest of our ingredients together or that we need to mise en place, and that's to separate our eggs. You'll notice that the recipe calls for four eggs, but it uses two whole eggs plus two yolks. So we're gonna have two egg whites that we do not need for this recipe. Now, if we separate our eggs well, then we can put those whites in a bag and then put them in the freezer and keep them for a recipe that only needs egg whites and we won't have to separate eggs for that. If we take care of them properly, they can stay in the freezer for about a year and they'll work just fine. It is important to remember that if even a drop of the yolk gets into the white, we're gonna have to throw it out because the recipes that call for just egg whites uh, cannot have the fat from the yolk uh, enable for, in order for the whites to be able to do what the recipe wants them to do. Now, I don't have an egg separator with me, but so I'm just using the egg shell to separate the eggs. So you crack the egg, hold the yolk in one side. You'll notice that I have three containers. I always use three containers when separating more than one egg because I need a container to crack the egg over and then I need a container to put the egg yolk in and a container to move the egg white to. 
and then I crack into the same container again or to the center container again. Now since this recipe has two whole eggs and two yolks, I'm separating the eggs first and going after those yolks because if I happen to pop the yolk and uh, I had some trouble separating it, I could simply put it all together and still use that egg because I do need two whole eggs for this recipe. So that's why I'm attempting to uh, separate the eggs first. And if I'm able to be successful with that, then I'll just add two more eggs. But if not, uh, I can still salvage it because it can be one of the two whole eggs. So now I have two egg whites separated with no drops of yolk. I'm going to set that to the side and in a, um, <clears throat> in a few minutes I'll put those in a freezer bag and label those with today's date and I'll be able to keep those in the freezer for up to a year and use them at a later time for a different recipe. So now I have two whole eggs and two egg yolks ready for my recipe when I get to that step. So the next thing we need to do is begin mixing our recipe and we're going to start by melting the butter. I have a half cup or one stick. I'm going to cut it into smaller pieces to help it melt a little bit better. We'll need two minutes or less in the microwave. When the melted butter comes out, we're going to add the chocolate. We'll break that into small pieces. We will use the entire box because it does say that it's four ounces and that's what the recipe calls for. So we'll put this in the microwave and then we'll mix in the chocolate. Now that our butter is melted, we're ready to mix in the chocolate. Like I mentioned, we're gonna use the entire box and we're gonna break it into small pieces so that it melts a little more easily. And um, you can start by breaking it up in the foil or you can break it as you add it into the butter. And then we're gonna stir it with a wooden spoon until it's stirred smooth and we see we don't want to see any large pieces of chocolate so the smaller you break these at the beginning the easier your task will be uh, at this step of the recipe so we're just going to add this chocolate get that entire package of chocolate in there break it into smaller pieces like i said the smaller your pieces the easier you're mixing Get all of that in there and then with a wooden spoon we're just going to stir it until the chocolate is smooth. So now that our chocolate has almost melted completely we're just stirring and checking for any last lumps of unmelted chocolate and then we're going to go ahead and set that aside and now we're going to work with our eggs and our sugar. So we'll use a whisk to beat this together and it should uh, take about a minute but it should get light and thick when we whisk it together. And we're going to do that before we add it to the chocolate mixture. So we're just going to whisk this for about a minute. If you are not used to whisking, this is going to seem like a lot of work. If you are working with someone else in the kitchen to make this, you can certainly take turns whisking. Um, just make sure that you get a good amount done and that it's done well so that you get that thickness in the egg and sugar mixture. Also, you should notice that the sugar is dissolving in this and uh, that's part of what we're trying to accomplish with this as well. So again, just about a minute of whisking and uh, the eggs and the sugar together and then we'll be ready to go on to the next step. Now that we finish whisking the eggs and sugar together we're ready to go on to the next step. <clears throat> we're going to add the flour and the egg and sugar mixture into the chocolate butter mixture and then we'll beat those together. So first we'll add the flour Next, we're going to add the egg and sugar mixture into the bowl with the flour, melted chocolate, and melted butter. 
We're going to scrape the uh, bowl to make sure that we get all of that mixture in there. So use a rubber scraper for that task. And then we'll use the wooden spoon to beat it all together. And we're just going to do this for a minute or two just until it's combined. And then we're going to divide it into the muffin tins. So we just want to make sure that we don't see any separate ingredients, that it's one homogeneous looking mixture, and then we'll be ready to put it in the muffin tins. So you could use a cookie scoop if you wanted to move the batter into the um, muffin tin, but since this mixing bowl has a spout on it, I'm going to go ahead and pour them in to each of the eight spots that we buttered and floured. Now it's important that you get some in every spot before you really um, use up all the batter. So we can go back and we can add to the ones that look a little bit low, but we wanna make sure that we have, it's a lot easier to add batter to a low uh, muffin tin spot than it is to try to move batter from the uh, fuller spots. So we're going to be a little conservative when we first put the batter into each of the cups that we're using. And then we'll go back and we'll add to the ones that look the lowest first. And we'll add again just a little bit at a time so that they all look about halfway full in the muffin cup. So just pour this in. See which ones are a little bit low. I do want to make sure that I get all of this batter into a, tin, a, a muffin tin, into one of the spots. So I'm going to scrape the wooden spoon, I'm going to scrape the container, and I'm going to make sure that all of the batter gets poured into one of the eight cups on this muffin tin. So now that we've scraped the bowl clean and gotten all of the batter into one of the cups on the muffin tin, and they're fairly equal. Before we put it in the oven, we want to clean up the top of this pan. You can see where some stray bits of batter have uh, gotten away from us, and so they're on top of the pan. And it is so much easier to take a clean, damp paper towel right now and just wipe that batter off. If you put it in the oven like that, you're going to be scrubbing that dish clean at the sink instead of the uh, simplicity that we have right now to just be able to wipe it clean and it comes out and it looks great and it's easy to clean up. So once we have all the markings off, all the little wisps of batter off, we'll be ready to move on to the next step. What I'm about to show you with the pans here on the counter should actually be happening when you put the 9 by 13 pan on the oven rack because you don't want to carry this across your kitchen or even lean over next to you to put it in the rack with everything stacked up. So we need to get some water that's already been heated and put it in our 9 by 13 pan and fill the 9 by 13 pan so that it's about halfway. So again, we would place the 9 by 13 pan on the uh, oven rack of the preheated oven. We would take that water that's been heated in a tea kettle or a saucepan and pour that in until it was halfway up. So I'm not going to do halfway up here because it's just an example, but you can see the steam that came off of that when I first poured it in. And then when that's in place, then we'll take our lava cakes and gently set them on top of the 9x13 pan. And what that does is it creates a water bath. We get a lot of steam that comes out from under the bottom of the pan and gently bakes the pan itself because all that steam comes in contact with the different spots on the muffin tin. So it keeps it a nice even bake. It keeps moisture in the um, baking process where normally baking is a very dry process and it will um, 
cause baked goods to crack and things like that. So the more delicate items often have what's referred to as a water bath. In this particular recipe, our molten lava cakes sit over the water bath. Some recipes, the um, food item is actually in the water bath. But we're gonna disassemble this and take it over and put it in the oven and bake it for seven to nine minutes at 450 degrees. Remember, whenever your timer, uh, your recipe gives you a time range, you always set the timer for the lowest amount of time. So now that our molten lava cakes have had some time to bake in the oven at 450 degrees, they were in there for about seven minutes. You can see that the sides are puffed up, the tops are barely set, and the cake still jiggles just a little when shaken. So I'm gonna let them sit in the muffin tin for a minute. And during that minute, they actually do continue to finish their cooking process. While they were in the oven, I got out some parchment paper and a jelly roll pan. And we're gonna use those to try to flip our lava cakes out of the pan. So after that minute has passed, now the minute's passed, we're gonna go ahead and put the parchment paper over the lava cakes, and then we're gonna turn the jelly roll pan upside down. And I'm still gonna use hot pads because that pan just came out of a 450 degree oven. And I'm gonna grab the muffin tin underneath and quick flip, give it a little tap on the counter. And I'm hoping that that tap was enough to get those lava cakes to drop out. So if not, I can tap it again, or I can tap a little bit on each uh, muffin spot where we have lava cakes. Give it a little shake. Tap it, see if I can't convince a few more of them to drop. Okay, so I got most of them to come out of there okay. So now they're ready to transfer to a nice plate and serve with a little garnish. Here we have our finished lava cake with a little accent of whipped cream to um, serve with it to make it even more enjoyable.